Hello, I'm Michael Wilde, I'm a VFX artist, and today we're going to be going with the very basics of texturing, theory, for VFX, but this information is probably going to also apply for games and games art as well. So why am I showing my face for once in an instruction? Well, A, I just got a new haircut, so obviously I had to show that off, and B, I wanted to set expectations now before we dive into the video, just so you know what this video is and what it isn't. So this video um, won't have any actual texturing in it. We will use substance to show what terminology and stuff means, what things should look like, but it's not going to be actual texturing. This is going to be for people brand new to texturing. If you don't know what a spec roughness should look like or what a normal map is, then this is the video for you. So I've already talked for way too long in this introduction, so let's just get started. Yeah, cool. So here's an image I found off Google, and no, I wasn't just Googling ridiculously expensive clocks. I think this perfectly sums up what I want to get across in this video. So let's say you'd been given this model from modeling or you'd made it yourself. Well, then you need to texture it. Like a lot of objects, often what you're texturing won't just be one kind of material. So here we've got some wood, we've got some metal, we've got some weird ornate details. So what you would need is you would need a texture map to define these different qualities. So we would need a texture map that defined this wood. We would need a texture map that defined this gold. But more than that, we would also need to define how shiny this gold was and how shiny this wood was. So this is quite shiny here, but here we've definitely got broader highlights. And then we would probably also want to define things like we've got these engravings. So we could go in and hand model this, but that's going to take a lot of time. But what we could do instead is we could texture these into something like a bump map. And we've got these scratches as well, and that could go into a bump map or a normal map. Let's take a look what else we've got here. So here we've got a very matte sort of look, this red thing underneath. So we want to define that and we want to make it so that it was less shiny than this gold that sat on top of it. And then here as well, we've got this engraving in this clock. So we'd probably want to put that into a map so that it sits in and we want to make it black and not shiny as well. So really that's what our textures will be doing. They will be defining the different qualities of all these different materials that are next to each other. The way we do that is we would use one channel or one map, for example, the color, one for how glossy it is, one for the bump or the detailing on the surface. So now we're going to go through every single map that you would probably come across when it comes to texturing and define what they are and how they look. Cool. So now we've looked at some real world reference. Uh, let's define a term that I'm going to use a lot, which is a texture channel. So a texture channel is a property of a shader, which can be defined by a texture map to alter how your 3D object looks. As a texture artist, we paint maps to change these properties or channels. Just like that image, you would have a channel which defines the color, you would have one which defines how shiny it is, and you would have another which defines the smoothness or bumpiness of the surface. So we're going to go through a list of the channels, the main ones that you will use or come across when you're texturing. So we're going to define what they are, what they do, what they usually look like. So first up, there's the base color. So the base color is a color map which represents the color of an object. If you're texturing a blue alien, this is where you would put the blue skin color. It's the color that you see at render time. So let's have a quick look. We've got a wood here. This, I'm looking at the material now in substance. If I go to base color here, we see exactly the same thing. It's the color of the wood. This map might be referred to in different ways. You can call it the base color, the color, the RGB, the diffuse. It kind of depends on naming conventions. While they can mean slightly different things in this very basic video, we're just going to define them all kind of as the same. If you want to know a little bit more about the difference between, for example, base color and diffuse, then there is a link in, in the description for documentation from Substance themselves, which defines some PBR terms and stuff like that. Um, a bit more in depth, we're not really going to do that. So like I said, on this wood one, it's the colour of the wood. If we have a look here, we're going to switch back over to the, the overall material. We've got this painted material with some rust. And if we go back to the base colour, then it's going to define where's yellow, where's more brown for the rust. That's base colour, the main one often that you'll be painting first. So up next, we have the bump or the displacement. So bump and displacements are two maps which change how the surface of a model looks. The black and white maps where anything above 0.5 in value up to white, which is pure one, will push the surface of an object outwards and 0.5 to black, which is a value of zero, will push the surface in. So a bump map or a displacement map are used for surface detail. If you have textured a surface as wooden, then you can use a bump map to add wood grain and details to it. And that way it helps it look less CGI. So a bump map just appears to move the surface. If you look at the side, then it will still look flat. It works with the lights in the scene to fake it, whereas a displacement map actually moves the surface, but at a greater cost to render time. So if you need something to actually displace the silhouette of your geometry, then you want to use a displacement. But if you're just going for fine details, then a bump map will do. 
Displacements are often extracted from sculpting software like ZBrush to add details like folds on costumes or wrinkles on faces without needing a high resolution mesh. Bump and displacement can be used together in your shader. For example, you could use a bump for much smaller forms like individual skin pores and then displacement for larger forms like actual wrinkles or folds in a face of a mesh. Here in Mari, I'm looking at a texture map that I painted myself a while ago for this cat. And you can see that where we've got skin bumps, they push out and are lighter values. And when there's wrinkles into the skin, then you've got darker values. So this is the raw map that we're looking at. And then if we just take a look at the shader, we can see that how as a bump map, it, it takes that in. And those bits that were lighter appear to push out and the bits that were darker appear to push inwards. And while it's not actually changing the silhouette of the object, it does appear like it's giving it more information. Now, if I were to remove that bump value, then you can see the difference that that has and there is no information. It doesn't look like there's any surface detail anymore. Here in Substance, we can see the displacement actually pushing the silhouette of the geometry. In Substance, they often refer to it as the height. So if I change the height channel and I bring the amount down, you can see that it's actually moving the edge of that model and adding this wood grain texture, not just faking it, but actually moving that object. That's the difference between displacement and bump. So the next map that we're going to talk about is a normal map, which is a special kind of map that does something similar to a bump. Just like a bump map, it fakes details on the surface of your object to make it look as if there's information that isn't actually there in the geometry. Unlike a bump map, however, it's not black and white. It actually uses red, green, and blue. They often look purple by default. If we take a look at this one here, to quickly summarize why it's purple, the map basically uses the red, green, and blue channels of the image to hold data which correspond to the tangents of the object's surface normals. What's a surface normal? Well, it's basically a line that sticks out perpendicular to the face of the model. The map then distorts the normals to make them appear as if they no longer point directly outwards. That may sound super complicated if this is your first time hearing about it, but quite simply, it means unlike a bump map, which appears to make a surface push up or down, with the three channels of the map, the surface can look like it's angled left or right, as well as in and out. So when the light hits it, you get a more realistic result. And I'll show you something on screen now that perfectly demonstrates that. Normal maps are used in games a lot, but not always in VFX. They can be harder to paint with since you're not just using a black and white map. There are ways to convert a bump map into a normal map, but converting a normal back into a black and white image can be really complicated. So if we just have a look at this, this map here, so this is a purple normal map that I sculpted in ZBrush to give me some scar detail and extra definition around the muzzle. So this is the map as it is, and then we're just gonna view that through the shader, and you can see that that information is now coming into the model, which wasn't originally there. So again, I'm just gonna unplug it, and we'll see how different that makes it look. So the next map we're gonna talk about is metallic. Metallic maps are used with the metallic roughness shader models that are becoming more common and used especially in games but also in VFX these days. A metallic map tells the shader which part of an object is a raw metal. A metallic map is a black and white map, it's grayscale. So while you can have values ranging from pure black to pure white and everything in between, because you're telling it what is a raw metal and what is not, usually you'll have values of pure black and pure white and not really much in between. White being the part of the object that is a metal and black telling you that it is not a metal. So why is this important? To put it simply, the specular of a metal is different to a non-metallic surface, which is often referred to as a dielectric. It's important when painting a metallic map to remember that rust, paint, dirt, and grime on top of a metal will be black in your metallic map as they are a layer covering that raw metal. So they themselves are not metallic. That might sound like a lot of information, but let's go inside a substance and break it down so that it's a bit easier to understand. So here what we've got is a smart material with a steel scratched underneath and on top of that I've put some dirt. So if we have a look at our metallic channel, where there is pure metal we have white and where there is the dirt on top we have black. This is the same for anything that isn't metallic would be black. So whether that's paint on top of a metal, whether that's rust because it's an oxidized metal and no longer a pure metal, then it would be exactly the same. If I go to this painted metal surface and go down to the metallic option, then I can change that myself and that will show you the difference between a metallic and a non-metallic surface and how it handles specular. So if I bring that up, now you can see it starts looking a lot more like gold and the specular highlight of the material has changed from instead of just pure white, it's gone to a much more goldy kind of reflection. And again, I'll leave a link in the description that goes through much more in depth about what the difference between metallic and non-metallic and how they handle the shading of that. So what you need to know is that if you're using metallic roughness material workflow, like Substance does by default and Mari can also do, then you need to make sure that if you have a metallic surface, you are making sure it's metallic is set to one. And if you have a non-metallic object, you set that to zero. 
Instead of the metallic roughness model, you can also use the spec glossy model. While I'm not going to go over specular and spec glossy now, it's important that when you're creating your textures in Mario Substance to know which shaders you will be using so you make the correct maps. For example, the Arnold standard surface shader uses metallic roughness, so I know I need those maps. In Murray, you can use a shader that has the same channel inputs to see how everything is working, or in Substance, when setting up your project, make sure you select the correct template. So I was just talking about a roughness, so let's define what a specular roughness map actually looks like. Specular highlights, as the name suggests, are the glints in the highlights on an object when a light hits it. By making an object look rougher, you make the highlights spread out. So for example, paper is very rough because the highlight is very spread out. And then by making it less rough, you get a much tighter highlight, sometimes even a reflection, like this. So things like polished metals, polished wood, polished surfaces are not very rough at all and look like this. A specular roughness map is a black and white map which defines how rough the surface is. Black is a tight specular highlight, white is a very rough and spread out highlight. So here where we're seeing a lot more reflection and a lot tighter highlight, then that's going to have a much darker value. Whereas here, where the rust is, we're going to have a much lighter value because there isn't as much of a highlight and it's much more spread out. So I'm going to change here to the roughness and we're going to see that. Exactly. So where it's rougher, it's lighter. Where it's dark, it's tighter. That can be quite a lot to wrap your head around. I know I still sometimes have to think oh, dark is tighter, white is lighter, because for some reason to me, my brain defaults the other way around. So it's a really important map. And along with color and bump, it can define quite drastically how an object looks. I always recommend trying to nail the specular roughness really early on. It's one of the channels I paint as soon as I can because it does define so much of the surfaces look. So we're in the final stretch now, and the last channel I'm gonna talk about today is masks. So masks are black and white maps that can be used to isolate areas of an object for different reasons. In VFX, I'm usually painting them so that I can give them to look dev to be able to make slight adjustments to different areas in case they need changing. If I'm doing personal work, I'll make masks for things like SSS or other shader properties that I don't want to be everywhere, or I wanna make adjustments to on the fly without having to retexture. So here inside of Mari, we're looking at an SSS map that I painted for this cat. So I didn't want there to be as much SSS on the nose part here or on the bridge of the nose, which is why they have got darker values. Darker values mean that they'll get less of an effect of whatever you plug this mask into. So in this example, it was SSS. As you can see, they're not completely black though. This collar area is completely black because that's a gold collar and I didn't want it to be any SSS whatsoever. Whereas because this is still skin, I painted it with a dark gray so that it still gets some of the effect. Since masks are black and white, then you can add three masks into a single RGB texture with each channel, red, green, and blue, corresponding to a different mask that can then be split out. So here inside of Mari, I've got three masks, the SSS, got my spec roughness, which could be also a mask, and I've got this mask for the collar. And then what I can do is I can combine the red, green, and blue so that in one single color image, I've got all of that data, which I can then split out later. This is called channel packing. I've made a separate video on creating a gizmo in Mari to set this up. If that sounds interesting, then you can check that in the description below. Channel packing multiple black and white maps is used in games to combine maps like metallic, roughness, and emissive all into one texture, saving memory. This isn't as important in VFX, but some companies I've worked at do ask me to combine three maps into one, some don't. That's why I bring it up. You can use masks for a multitude of different problems. I haven't touched on emissive maps, for example, in this video, but an emissive map is basically just a mask to tell an object where to emit light and where to not. So here we've got this light bulb. This is on the Arnold documentation. And what they've done is they've created an emissive material on this light bulb. So you could do a map that was pure white here and then black here so that only the light bit emitted light. Emissive maps are used much more in games than they are in VFX, but it's just good to know that an emissive map is basically a mask, and masks are super important when it comes to texturing. So that's about all we're gonna cover in this very basics of texturing and texture theory. We haven't touched on things like image depth, color space, or file formats in this video, and I'm gonna save that for another one because that can go quite in depth, and I'm still writing the script for it. Hopefully this has covered the majority of questions you might have when you're starting to texture. One thing I didn't mention is that you're not necessarily gonna use all these maps in every single shader. Sometimes you might just use a color and a spec roughness, for example, or you might just need a bump and a color. It really does depend on the task you've got and how high detailed the object needs to be and what kind of properties you're trying to plug into a shader that you need maps for at the end. Cool. I've been Mike Wilde. This has been Texture Theory 101. I don't know what I'm calling it yet. Take it easy. Best of luck, whatever you're doing in 3D and have a good one. Cheers.